One of the important things to know about wool is how the fibre is constructed. So it's hair, and this is a keratin outside. It looks a little bit like scales, grows a bit like a palm tree. So as the hair grows up, so it creates these little scales. And then inside, and I'm not going to draw this right, it has lots of different cells, a little bit random. And within those, lots of other components with some air gaps. Now that's very not technical and you can look all this up technically properly, but it's a bit complicated for today. And so therefore it insulates and this also, the irregularity of the hair cells on the outside means that it, it when a wool fibre is up against another wool fibre, there's a very tiny layer of air and that means it's insulating. Wool is the hair of animals and uh, mostly it's sheep but it does include camel or angora rabbits or mohair goats that give us cashmere. So here we're looking at different types of wool fibres. Both of these are found on the hillside. Um, I have difficulty recognising different sheep types. Um, this could be a Scottish black face. It's very coarse. Um, it means it's a sort of highland sheep and it would be used, these fibres would be used probably for carpets. This one is a much more common sheep. I can't tell you what it is because somebody writes to me and tell me I've got it wrong. But it's very important to look at this because you see how curly it is. It's very curly and the fibre is pretty even. So what happens here is that we could use this for a jumper. It may even be Shetland because I live in Scotland and so it could be that. It's very curly. It's quite coarse. The fibre itself is quite long. Look, I've stretched out a fibre there. And that's what's important for wool. The characteristic of the fibre and the length of what we call the staple. You can see it's come off a hill. It's even got a blob of colour. There we are. When the wool is going to be processed, it goes into um, the factory and it is washed and combed. So the fibres are all in one direction. And this is merino. Now merino is very often from Australia. The, the sheep is called the merino sheep. The fibre is a very long, very silky, very even staple. Can you see? It's quite different to what I think was Shetland we were just looking at. And that means that it can be woven very finely and turned into different types of garments. The processing is pretty well the same if we're simplifying things. Look at the length of that staple. It's hugely long, so it means it can be woven tightly. This is called a top. It's when the wool has been brushed all in one direction. I'm messing it up now. And it's washed, it's combed, and it's ready for dyeing and spinning. This merino is very silky, as you can see. So there are two ways of making yarn. You either dye it solid colour, like this and this now is cashmere it's uh i've had this sample a while so you can see it's broken up but cashmere is very fine and very soft with a slightly shorter staple that's why cashmere can pill more easily and you either dye it solid or you dye it in different colors and then you blend it when you're blending it you lay out what you need in terms of color and you brush them together so that the colours become mixed. I won't do this very well because it's with my fingers, but it'll give you an illustration. There, so you will end up with, say, an overall blue look of cloth, but it will have definite texture to it. We'll look at that later. In production, when you're spinning, you gradually pull these fibres till they're narrow, narrow, and do that over a series of rollers then twist at the end. And these fibres stick together because we've looked at the hair construction. And once they're twisted, they can become very strong. There we are, very strong and quite fine. So here's a cashmere yarn. And the important thing about this is it still has a texture in it, even though it's fine and strong and can be put through machinery. Then if you're doing hand knit, this is a sort of hand knit design and if you were doing machine knitting, you'd want it to be more tightly spun. So here's a variety of machine knitting wools. Um, these have been two, two directions. They've been spun back on one another. They've been plied for additional strength. 
Here you can see solid colour, solid colour, I'm guessing, solid colour. But the others are probably mostly blends for texture because this is an old-fashioned Shetland yarn range. By now we've realised that wool is not just straight wool, that each wool is chosen to make a texture. So here's a lamb's wool jumper, it's in fact shrunk a bit, so it's made of felt. Here's an alpaca jumper that I've had for years, which is just deliciously soft. This is a suiting sample, um, very lovely, would make a fantastic coat, hangs and drapes beautifully. And here are some samples of merino suitings from Italy. And here's a jacket also that's slightly heavier uh, from Italy. So look at the, the, the yarns are very fine, but the technical nature of the weaving of the wool also means that you have a fantastic trouser weight. So wool is very versatile, but there are some characteristics it has in common. It doesn't crease very much. It's not like cotton or linen. And that's because it always maintains some moisture. And it also is water resistant. So it doesn't matter which item we put the water on, it will resist. How's that lovely? However, eventually it will absorb the water. It can absorb up to 35% of its weight in water. So otherwise we'll wait for ages. Look, there. Suddenly the fibres absorb it. And it's very warm, as we've looked at, because it has this uh, insulation characteristic. But because it can retain the water and it doesn't go that cold, unless it was, of course, freezing, um, it's been used in cold climates for a long time. And wool was very important. The Guernseys, in fact, Guernseys were worn by the first explorers of the South Pole. Um, and uh, so wool is very versatile and, of course, it's biodegradable.